just a, a thank you to the uh, people in the audience and the industry. Uh, <clears throat> all the things that we do here over all these years are really uh, uh, something that's been contributed by all the rebuilders. So the things that we learn and we present to the customer base are usually deviations of OE uh, type of products that uh, would make the uh, rebuilding process better, able to save blocks, save cams, uh, get better oiling, get other things. And 90% uh, uh, of that is based on your input. And we are very appreciative of everything that you've done to help us be successful in the automotive industry. So this is just a quick snapshot of our plant inside. Um, uh, we also have lots of CNC equipment as well. We also have another room that's everything to do with uh, condominium valve seats. And that's quite uh, interesting too. We had that on our last uh, webinar. <coughs> so a little bit about Duramon, as we mentioned, uh, world leader in camshaft bearings and others over 70 years. Um, we're ISO 9000, Oliver White, best in class. Um, so those gives us some things for our business to be sure we're successful. One of the big questions is uh, certainly why use bearings at all? Obviously it's to uh, survive metal to metal conditions, start stop uh, compatibility, to embed foreign materials before it causes failures, to conform to the system geometry variations, and provide sacrificial wear surface that's required to uh, make that engine last. <coughs> um, lots of different bearing materials are available. We have the uh, copper lead, trimetals, aluminum tin, and white metals. And of course, the white metals are what we use, which is a tin-based, lead-based babbit, and it has excellent soft phase properties to be able to do the things we talked about previously in the um, um, being able to embed and all those other things that are required. This is a chart that's kind of a maybe a little confusing, but on the top it shows the the tin and lead white based materials. And uh, over on the far right it shows the uh, soft journal so it's going to be able to uh, uh, absorb those things we talked about earlier and be the best as far as uh, conforming to uh, housing sizes and uh, to camshafts and other things that need uh, a softer material also with embeddability. Just some uh, definition of terms uh, as we go through this. As you can see, there's uh, eccentricity that's in there that's important, the bearing load, the uh, minimum film thickness, uh, the oil inlet, the journal, and the housing. So these are uh, definitions of terms that are important as we go through the other pieces. Um, <clears throat> with me today, I have uh, Bob McBroom. Bob is our uh, Vice President of Engineering and Operations. Uh, Bob has been with us uh, about almost 30 years, answering calls, designing things, uh, tech tips, tech questions, and so he's kind of the, the doctor of all of knowing how to design and answer some of these questions. So I'm going to have him assist me with a, a few of these uh, pieces that are right up his alley. So um, um, I'm going to bring him on in just a moment. <coughs> so within the camshaft bearings and bushings, the ones that we make are 100% sheen surface design and provides the tightest tolerance to the industry. We uh, centerless grind the ODs, centerless bore the IDs, and that results in uh, variations of uh, five ten thousands, giving the customer increase uh, system design flexibility. We can both do high and low runs, so we have a strategic partner in the industry to design, develop, and manufacture. We have great delivery. Uh, we make to stock. We make to order. We have technical design assistance with engineering people on hand. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on, many things that have been brought to us over the years are the enhancement of the OD <coughs> cam bearing design, including OD 
moves to enhance oiling, larger ODs to save a flock, smaller IDs to improve oil pressure, wider positions to reduce the oil link, leakage, ID grooves to improve oiling and reduce the oil hole sizes and to relocate them to improve oiling. We also have, of course, overhead cam repair barriers. So the parameters around that um, are a number, and I'll let uh, Bob start to talk about some of these pieces that uh, are crucial to designing a great bearing. Yeah, these, these parameters would be used by a design engineer at the OE level. And as they design these bearings, obviously they're going to make some compromises, but they're going to be interested in lubricant viscosity, and that would be like low, low viscosity oils run in late models. Engine lubricant flow path and rate, load per unit area of the bearing, speed of the shaft, the radial clearance, fit and surface finishes, and materials of construction. Many times at the OE level, uh, compromises are made for economical reasons and not necessarily good designs. The factors dependent on the design would be the coefficient of friction in the bearing a temperature rise that's tolerable for long, long life, oil flow rate, how much pump work is, is going to be used up. The minimum oil film thickness is very important in the design level, and maximum oil film pressure, and the stability of the bearing shaft system, we'll get into that a little bit later, and the transition period for hydro, hydrodynamic operation. This is uh, important in start-stop engines lately because, as we'll see later, um, that's the worst conditions for a, a germ bearing. This is a simple diagram of one cam position. The E in the center region is eccentricity. The shaft must move off center of the bore center line to form an oil wedge. Without eccentricity, the oil film will not support the load and wiping of the bearing is likely likely to occur. The most um, the casual observer will note that this is a single cam bearing and the block cam bearing bores must be in close alignment to get the eccentricity for the oil wedge to form. The minimal oil film thickness is approximately two ten thousandths of an inch in late model engines and the eccentricity is on the order of, say, six ten thousandths of an inch. Also note, engine pump pressure is not required for an oil wedge to form, only flow. This graph shows the friction regions of regimes of bearing in operation. The boundary and mixed film regimes are not suitable for engines but will occur when starting and stopping. The short story here, for instance, if you have low viscosity lubricant to increase the hydrodynamics, you need higher speed or a low, lower load. This graph shows the relationship of surface finish and minimum oil film thickness. For minimum wear, the film thickness has to be thicker than the surface roughness or damage to the bearing surface will occur. So in late model engines, the surface finishes have to be much better since they have real low minimum oil film thickness. So we get a lot of questions on the phone about how we determine the wall thickness of a bearing and the resulting oil clearance. These simple equations here will allow the guy in the field to calculate his, his theoretical oil clearance before assembly of the engine. 
we take the, the measured housing bore minus two times the wall thickness of the bearing will be the inside diameter when it's installed. And then you take subtract the inside minus the shaft, and that will give you the diametral oil clearance. The following formulas using the lower housing bore value for the higher wall thickness value will get the lower range for the oil clearance. The upper oil clearance would be the opposite. So we get a lot of calls about people ending up with 5,000 soil clearance. In this example, let's say typical small block Chevrolet, you take the actual measurements of minimum, of, uh, the maximum material condition, and that means a small housing, a large shaft, and a thick wall, we get down to 1,000 diametral oil clearance. We take the minimum material condition, a large bore, a small wall, and a small shaft, we end up with five, a little over 5,000 diametral oil clearance. While everything is still within tolerance, there's nothing we can do other than select fit a bearing to reduce the maximum diametral oil clearance. <clears throat> now this slide here shows some of the anomalies that we can find in, in camshafts as they're polished and ground. And all these are detrimental to hydrodynamic lubrication. Many of these will increase the pressure and fatigue bearings, or worse yet, completely wipe them. So as you can see, there's uh, quite a bit to all of this trying to figure out how to design a, a bearing. And uh, uh, certainly uh, most of that is beyond me and some others. So that's why we have people that uh, have extraordinary talents like Bob and other engineers that we have. So when uh, you're calling on the phone, saying, gee, I have a problem, I'm trying to figure out this, these are a number of questions that would be asked to you to try to figure out the best type of bearings and bearing material that's going to work ideally for your application. So there's there's quite a bit to it. It seems like, oh, it's just a round thing, put it in there, should work fine. But as uh, we talked on the beginning, the most important part is that it creates a, a hydrodynamic wedge underneath the camshaft, lifts the camshaft, and it, it runs on that uh, film of oil. And then everything is great. If it doesn't run out of film oil, lots of bad things happen. <coughs> so <clears throat> as we're looking at this slide, it talks about some of the conditions that can cause bearing failure. Obviously, foreign particles in the lubricant, off the geometry as we talked about earlier, extended transition period for hydrodynamic operation, means it doesn't get the oil there, create the wedge, lift it up, the camshaft up, run on the hydrodynamic film. A thickened lubricant or incorrect lubricant viscosity, uh, lubricant uh, dilution, overloading, shaft housing, uh, deformation, uh, corrosion, and incompatible materials. So there's a lot of things that can cause a, a problem. And uh, sometimes the camshaft bearing itself becomes the sacrificial lamb for uh, keeping it going. And, um, but there could be lots of other causes for that going forward. Um, this uh, piece here, <coughs> excuse me, is a uh, AERA technical bulletin. And it talks about installing where the oil feed hole is optimum clock position. And uh, so this is a box, the head's using 360 degree oil groove located behind the bearing oil feed allow one to move the clock position of the cam bearing oil feed hole. This way you can adjust the clock position and the cam installation to make sure the optimum location is best for a hydrodynamic wedge. And the wedge is everything. It's selected. Locating and installing the cam bearing to take advantage of the hydrodynamic wedge 
will supply the maximum support for the camshaft during engine operation. The direction of the camshaft rotation and the engine oil entry point into the bearing control the placement of the hydrodynamic wedge. If the oil feed passage in the block to the head is just a hole without a 360 degree groove, the bearing hole must line up with the oil feed passage in the block of the head. In some cases, the bearing oil feed hole in the cam bearing also lines up with a groove cut in the camshaft journal. In those instances, the location of the bearing oil feed hole in the bearing is also critical fore and aft and may not match up 100% with the hole in the block of the head. If the camshaft being used is driven by a gear-to-gear -gear arrangement or reverse rotation with the chain drive, the cam bearing feed hole will require repositioning to the opposite lower side because due to the fact that the camshaft is turning in the opposite direction. So with all that verbiage, here's a little bit of a picture that shows where it, it would be ideally to be. So you can see that the, the best place for it is around the four o'clock position. And uh, that allows the best uh, rotation of the oil around to be able to give a hydrodynamic wedge, lift the cam, and put it in the right spot. This is a question that comes up many, many times. And this is a great piece that AERA Association put out to be able to address the, the question. <clears throat> Some other things that are important is uh, oversized and undersized cam bearings for different applications. Uh, oversized ODs can uh, be available for line board in the blocks, save a block, undersized for IDs for cam salvage if the cam has been ground. Uh, Semi-finished IDs for line boring and uh, onboard IDs allow line boring after bearing installation. As probably most of you know, on the OE basis, when an OE puts a, a cam bearing in a block, um, they put a semi-finished bearing in the block, they line bore the block, and that's obviously the best that's possible to make sure everything lines up perfectly. In the aftermarket, that doesn't exist. So we're trying to find a set of best case scenarios to take care of that. The housings that may not line up properly, uh, the cam may be a problem, lots of other things. And so we're dealing with a number of, of uh, pieces that are a little suspect from the original line boring. Line boring at the OE or in the aftermarket is always the best, but that's uh, typically not available for most uh, rebuild is in the aftermarket. This is a really important piece here <clears throat> on the high performance side of things. Uh, as you build uh, engines and people come in, they say, gee, I want to build a, a, a nice little street machine and I'm going to put special um, pistons in it. I'm going to put some uh, special cam in it. I'm going to uh, increase the spring pressure a bit on it and a number of things. These uh, high performance cam bearings should be uh, a perfect match that should be compatible going over the counter with all those applications that you sell. And the reason for that is that they're uh, uh, a unique piece of product that we make with a micro Babbitt chill cast. They're, each uh, bearing is individually hand burnished to be sure that it has a, a micro Babbitt effect to it. They have twice the uh, spring pressure that it can take, and they should be just an automatic piece. If you say, I'm gonna build an engine, I want a high performance oil pump, I want a high performance cam, I want high performance springs, I want all those kind of things. This should be the absolute natural that goes with those package over the counter. In addition to that, we have the uh, coated high performance bearings. <coughs> and they're basically the, uh, the regular bearings with another coating on it. And the coating is there for a fatigue life. And it provides an extra level of thermal barrier for dry starts, or, or as Bob was saying earlier, for stop and go type of things that come along. 
So these are really important pieces. I know that uh, people use their regular cam bearings forever and they get great results, but uh, there's an opportunity to give them a better product and also another uh, proper opportunity for you because they sell for it a bit more as well along with other high performance products that you're going to be moving over the counter for that engine to build. Um, we use a calico uh, coating on our particular uh, cam bearings. It's a poly uh, coat which is a dry lubricant. It provides ability to retain oil on the overlay even during momentary oils, starvation, and high pressure conditions. <coughs> it has a, you know, a black appearance, the typical thickness as you can see, operating temperatures, reduced friction on dry starts, uh, increased abrasion resistance, lower coefficient of friction, retains oil, and reduced bearing temperature, increasing the fatigue line. This is an ad that we've used over time, but uh, it talks about the enhanced engineering solutions. We talked about before, uh, different grooves, different oil holes, oversized, undersized, semi-finished, all the things that you need in the rebuilding market to be able to make these things last that uh, they weren't necessarily designed for in the original OE configuration. This is an interesting piece here. Uh, this is our typical CH8 Chevy 350. As you can see, we have a, a regular CH8. We have a high performance CH8. We have a high performance coated. We have uh, oversized uh, that you can be able to fix a block. We have also at the bottom a CH-8W. That's a 1,000th undersized. Sometimes cam is, is ground a little bit or worn and that gives a little bit more oil pressure. So there's a whole host of other uh, possibilities that can be used versus just the standard CH8 that came from the factory. Lots of things to hold the block, hold the cam, uh, make fixes that you need. These are a few little fixes that we've done with the partnership like with Jasper, we did some of these. The CH8W uh, increased the wall we're controlling oil, 17, 21. As you can see, there's some uh, the 12, CH12B big block. It has an OD groove, allows uh, relocation of the oil inlet. And then we have some things with the new LS. Some other ones that we've done, <coughs> have done as well, uh, again, to uh, reduce the oil flow, increase load capacity, uh, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, even on that F F30X, that's one where we change the two holes instead of slots. Keeps them from buckling when the slots are installed and controls the oil flow. Another one that's always been a problem is the um, Jeep. The Jeep is a, a problem uh, engine and uh, the OE type of cameras made for that are not sufficient and they uh, blow a lot of oil away from the, the cam uh, bearings themselves. So we've uh, changed the OD to put a groove in position uh, two and three, and that helps to control some of the oil, oil flow. Uh, we also have some applications to um, repair overhead cams. So um, it can be repaired and save the, the engine, the head, and so forth. Uh, that's a nice little piece that is good for, uh, again, uh, saving engines and, and keeping the cost down. Um, this piece is an interesting piece, again, put out by AERA. And this is a, a tech bulletin talking about the, uh, the GM LS engines. Uh, GM had talked about that there were some problems that they were having on the LS engines. And they determined that they needed to have uh, a coated bearing to put into that engine to be able to make that uh, uh, cam bearing last. So uh, that's something that's been designed. Um, in this next slide here, it shows the, the different applications that they do. That's the early 
uh, blocks up to 2009, and the other ones uh, 2009 to present. Uh, Jerobon also offers uh, applications to this. So the first design is our CH10, uh, 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 and actually a CHP10T would be the coded version. And then the second design is the CHP25 T for the code of the, uh, one for the later blocks. So those are available in the aftermarket and uh, suggested by GM as the pieces needed to make those uh, engines last. This is a list of those I just mentioned. Um, the early design, both in standard, high performance and coded. Uh, the, the second design, which is uh, the same with regular standard encoded, and then the third design. You may make a note <clears throat> that the uh, CH25 is really the same uh, cam bearing as the 23, except that it's a wider position, and the 25 could be used in place of the 23. It's just a little wider in the width. Uh, we also have some things again, at the request of some of our uh, builders out there to be able to save blocks and, and save cans. So sometimes the can will get uh, uh, ground and you need a little bit different size. So you can see that we have undersized bearing sets to be able to help with uh, saving a cam. And by the same token, we have the same thing for saving a block. Blocks are expensive. And uh, you want to be able to save them when necessary. In order to save them, you'll see on this first one, positions 1 to 5 are 20 over in the stock size, uh, 2 and 4 are 10 over. These require that they be a board, the uh, uh, housing board out to be able to fit those sizes in there. But again, a way to save a block rather than just to discard it. So these are available also from us. And again, they're a result of uh, people asking, you know, I got a block and they'll be able to figure out how to save it. And um, can you give me an alternative? So we've developed those alternatives to help you uh, save a, a block or a can. <clears throat> we also just put out a new brochure that says all the different things we have in the LS side of things. We have it for the cam bearings. We have a connecting rod bushing engine hardware, hardware kits valve seats, the valve springs. So within this list, <clears throat> there's lots of different pieces. Uh, we have uh, the, a number of engine uh, hardware kits. Makes it really easy to be able to have all those in one package. We have one package, which is a, a small kit, just has the basics, a larger one that has some bolts as well in it. Uh, a good way to be able to have those available to be able to build those engines in one uh, kit and also a, a piece that has a part number. You can put that on your build sheet and uh, recoup some profit out of that. We also list on here some valve seats that are available. We talked about that in the beginning of the little video, that there's some copper infiltrated seats that are also used in those LS engines. And they're critical, uh, particularly on the exhaust side, to be able to get the heat out. So there's something that should be used in all applications where possible to be able to enhance the heat transfer out of that head. Uh, also some shims. And then as you see up above in the very beginning, there's those cam bearings we talked about on the page before. We have some new cam bearing sets. Uh, these two that I'm going to talk about were difficult ones. This was for the um, a GM LT motor. And at the time, this uh, motor was uh, built. Um, it had a, a, one of the positions which was uh, built into the block. So if you wanted to change the cam bearings out, you couldn't. You had to buy a new block. So we have redesigned that so the cam bearings can be replaced and they're available as this CHP-26T. They can help to not have to buy a block. <clears throat> Same thing happened on the Chrysler and the Hemi. They had a, a block as well that one of the a, a cam bearing positions was fixed and um, we designed it so that it could be removed and, and replaced 
And again, you didn't have to buy a block. Nice savings for that. Keeps the rebuilding industry moving along without that. <clears throat> so with all that said, um, we're very appreciative for everything that uh, you folks uh, give us information so we can provide better services to the uh, rebuilding uh, community. Uh, we uh, cherish all of your help with that and, uh, and your business. And uh, I guess at this point, we could open up for some questions.